All right, for the Bell 205, for this platform here, I'm gonna start off um, with heavy weapons rigging first. Now, the 205, the Huey platform is pretty, they're pretty consistent across the board. Uh, all the older models from Vietnam to nowadays pretty much have most of the same deck hardware, deck rings and ceiling hardware. Um, so not a, lot of, not a lot of differences like you'll find in your 500s, your Jet Rangers, your A-Stars, and all those other really common aircraft that can have different internals. So that's a good thing about this platform. The bad thing about this platform, it's loud. You can hear it coming from miles away. So if that's a, if that's a factor in your mission planning, then you need to think about proper aircraft selection there. But if you utilize this, it's a, it's a common military aircraft. Uh, a lot of uh, outsourced agencies use them, some law enforcement agencies use them. So we'll go ahead and talk about how to rig this aircraft. All right, for heavy weapons, I'm going to go ahead and utilize the same deck hardware sling retention that Chris was using the A-Star earlier. Uh, since we've got really heavy deck rings here, really big deck rings, I can actually utilize the carabiners inside of them and put the quick releases on my rigger's belt, unlike what Chris had to do over there. So for this, there's deck rings all over the bottom of this aircraft for this size retention sling. I found the one that works for me. So I'm going to go ahead and clip the carabiner in with the gate up. Always a good thing to remember there when you're clipping in carabiners. The way you can access, I'm going to lock, I'm going to lock the carabiner down. See them over here, I found this side. Um, for me, it's a second ring in. Make sure that our rings are Make sure that our locking carabiner is facing upward. Lock that one down. So basically we have the same system as what we had over on the A-Star. We're utilizing the rigger's belt. I'm gonna go ahead and clip in the snap shackle with the release lanyard out. And come over here and do the same thing with this other one. Release lanyards out. So if I need to get out of the system, I can come out really quickly if I need to. But these things are bomber. And I've never seen them released prematurely. Okay guys, that's a heavy weapons rigging right there for the shooter rigging. I'm not outside the aircraft because I'm about to have a big weapon system. I got this Sasser right here uh, we're about to employ. I'll show you the proper hardware for this type of system or bolt guns. And uh, for that, again, I'm a little bit back inside the bird, okay, because this weapon is really heavy. So let's go ahead and roll right into the sling system. What I've got here is a 10-foot Prusa cord I've doubled over, again with a double fisherman's knot, okay, and I've got two, for this case, just non-locking carabiners. What I'm going to utilize here are these OSHs, okay, or O-shit handles. These handles go into the, the deck rigging or the ceiling rigging of the, uh, the Bell 205. So this one's already in in the location that I need it in, and for these, basically, you just pop them in, press it up, and then again, you want to double check, make sure they're solid. All I'm going to do is take our nine lockings and hook them into the metal D-ring portion of the OSH. Okay, so this is pretty much it. This is my system right here. Now, for like the 50 count, starting with it since it's the heaviest weapon system, and like we said earlier, maybe we've got it employed on an armored vehicle or something like that. Maybe it's military. Hey, maybe somebody stole an armored vehicle um, in a city somewhere, and you guys got to put it down. They're armed and dangerous. They're shooting everybody and uh, you guys have made the decision to take the vehicle out, I'd probably pick this weapon system to do it. So what I'm going to do from here is, all, is I'm going to take the Prusa cord and I'm going to run it between the bipod and the upper receiver of the weapon. Okay, so basically when I lean this thing forward and press it outside the aircraft, it's resting against the bipod adapter. Okay, so now that is pretty much it. So what I have here is a good range of motion. It'll slide, and I'm not really holding the weapon's weight. The weapon's doing all the work, and the sling's doing all the work. So all I need to do is, for me, the kneeling position is the most comfortable for this, okay? I can still see, I've got a pretty good view, about 160 degrees right here from inside the aircraft. Obviously, it's hard for us to get outside the aircraft like we did on the A-Star because we've got a 30-something pound weapon here. For uh, weapons manipulation, I like to put my hand on the carrying handle here if you've got one. If not, you can still get a good high center of the bore grip and lock that elbow out so you can handle that recoil, okay? Because you may be shooting at a real extreme angle here. Now, if I need to adjust or shoot, I can slide this thing down, I can engage, I can switch knees if I have to, and I can drive out, push out, and engage almost to the rear of the aircraft. So I've got a pretty big range of motion with this big gun, and I can slide it quickly if I need to. 
Okay, so that's what we want to get here. And this is probably the most practical and the easiest system to use with the uh, 50 cal system like this. All right, let's show a, uh, a lighter weapon system. Let's put a bolt gun in here. So this is a smaller patrol 308. What I'm going to do here, obviously we can check. We've got night vision on this one. It's set up for our night ops. Um, but uh, it's for good weight purposes. We can go ahead and test the system now. And so we're going to do the same thing. I'm just going to put it between the receiver and the bipod. Okay, so now I can get some dry practice with this as far as feeling the weight feels good there for daytime operations we're obviously going to go ahead and take it off okay utilizing a bolt gun in the same system the reason I like to do that is so I have forward pressure on the gun um, I can work the action of this gun with almost one hand so that means I can keep another hand on the gun keep my cheek on the gun look through the optic hopefully I've got a, mag a variable power optic where I can tone down like we talked about earlier and I can keep on target, I can cycle the bolt and never come off the target by just keeping those mechanics working for me. So unlike the, the single point system or the bungee system, I want to be able to have all the mechanics working for me. I want to be able to have as many things going here for me as possible. My hand's on the gun, I can utilize this hand freely, I can stay on my target looking through the optic, and I can fire and rapid bolt manipulation, fire, rapid bolt manipulation, because that's that's going to be a very limited time frame that you have with this particular weapon system to get rounds on target, unlike an auto gun. So again, that's why I like to choose this particular system for a bolt action weapon, because it's helping me help the weapon. Alright guys, let's move in to the same system that we had on the A-Star and the Huey, working light weapons and uh, squad automatic weapons. Okay guys, so I've taken down my heavy weapons rigging here, and now I'm going to go ahead and move out on the skid more, so I need to move my retention lanyards forward one D-ring or deck ring. So again I'm going to hook them in, lock them down, do a tension check and now I'm outside the bird and I've got good tension either way just like we had earlier on the A-Star. I can slide back and forth, I can see now almost 100 and almost 200 degrees plus. Okay, So this is where I want to be. We're going to go ahead and rig the saw first before we get into light weapons. Now the saw, like we talked about earlier in the weapons system segment, has got its own sling system. Now all we're going to do here is this is going to be connected into one of those OSHs. So we're going to take that OSH down that's over here. I'm just going to move it straight above my head. Take my carabiner and I'm just going to hook it in right here into the red. So now as you guys could see, this thing kind of works like it's on its own little gyro system. We developed this over in Iraq. Uh, we were running saws a lot as a suppression weapon and it's really, again, like I said earlier, it's, it's surprising how accurate this weapon can be full auto from an aerial platform when you use the fundamentals correctly. So again, I've got my sling system going for me. I've got that shock cord going. I've got a good balance here. If I need to relinquish control, I can relinquish control with it and do other things if I absolutely need to. But this is pretty simple. We've got that same mounting system as a light weapon and now I can transition this weapon all the way around and I have hardly any of the weight of the weapon in my hands. But all the vibration has gone out of it because I'm outside the aircraft. So I can sit there and get target 1 o'clock, 200 meters, and start engaging, 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 and just shift all the way. Now, if you're a taller guy, what you can do is I like to get a little more leverage. I like to put my foot down on the skid. So I'm actually utilizing the back of my calf against the top skid or the foot rest and my foot is down locked onto the skid and I've got my forward foot here. This gets me outside the aircraft a little bit more and gives me more weapons manipulation leverage. It gives me more of a recoil abutment to recoil against for this bolt to come back against. So now when I'm engaging, 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 here I get to a stress point. But that's okay. All I need to do is shift my ass off the seat, step down and step up. So it puts me outside the aircraft more and actually gives me a way better shooting platform. All right, so that's the advantage of that of both of those positions. Again, if you're the shorter guy, I like to put my foot here against this little this skid bar or this footstep bar because that gives me again leverage, and we want to have leverage. We want to have all our body mechanics working just like if we're on the flat range or shooting in a shoot scenario on the ground. I want to be able to utilize that up here in the air as well. The other great thing about this sling system, not only does it take all the vibration out and give me a hands-free gyro feel of the gun, it also helps me if I have to do weapons manipulation. Okay, if I engage, 
and I get a misfire, I can easily grab the gun and it stays here. It's controlled, the weight is controlled by the airframe, and I can manipulate this gun if I need to. Instead, if I didn't have a sling system, it would be sitting on my lap freehand, which a lot of guys like to do. But now you're doing a lot more. You've got, a, you've got more work to do here. You've got to control the weapon harder here, and then you've got to get the weapon back up. Okay? Now you can keep it in your shoulder and do it as well, but it's just better. It's value added to have the aircraft helping you throughout shooting and weapons manipulation, so why not use that? And that's why we picked this simple system here. When uh, manipulating the saw, if you do need to reload it, you can see, like we talked about earlier, where these are connected to the front sight. That's why you have two points here. So it takes off a lot of the weight of the weapon, and now I'm free to work, change my box, my belt, whatever I need to do, get back in, slap it down, charge it, and continue to fight. Okay? So that's a saw weapon system there. And you can also do it with other various squad automatic machine gun uh, systems. Okay, guys, let's move more into light weapon systems. Okay guys, so what we're doing now is we're moving into uh, our lightweight practical weapon system, our carbine, uh, my weapon of choice for most 95% of most aerial operations like we've talked about. I'm going to utilize the same anchor point as I did on the squad automatic weapon system and I'm going to utilize the same tension sling that Chris used in the A-Star earlier. I've got a carabiner on the end of it. We're going to go ahead and lock it in to the D-ring portion of the OSH. Okay. Now, I've adjusted this to fit for me in my weapon system. So a good thing to always carry with you are retainer bands, okay, or rubber bands. Because the last thing you want is this whipping you in the face at, at 100 knots. So just get it up as high as you can. I like to use a heavy weight retainer band, double it over, and that's good. That'll stay out of your way. So again, same rigging, shooter rigging system as we had on the, on the squad automatic weapon. So I'm moved out, I'm on the skid again. Now I'm just gonna take my carbine, take my QD, Stick it in the QD cup on the stock. Now I'm ready to go. Let's talk about some weapons manipulation. Some key factors that you need to take into consideration when you're engaging a target at a moving speed. Uh, we like to call it lag, okay, because we're not leading a target anymore, because we're no longer a stationary shooting platform. We are now a moving platform that shoots. Now the target is basically stationary, comparable to our aircraft uh, speed, okay? So what we have to do, instead of leading that target like we typically would do in a ground situation, we now have to lag the target, which what happens is our forward speed and that bullet flying flies forward with your forward momentum of the aircraft and meets the target. All right, we're clear on that one. Okay, so that's why we lag the target. We hold the leading or the tail edge of it, depending obviously on your aircraft speed and your distance. Okay, a typical safe shot, 150 to 200 feet to out to 200 yards. Anything beyond that, I kind of get in that liability zone. Unless I'm doing a suppression, like destruction raid, I know I'm going to kill somebody. Um, then I'll attempt to fire that shot, especially with a saw or something like that. And I know it's in a, um, in a faraway land where we can, we can do that, and that's what the mission calls for. But for more of a precision shot, making your hits, and what's going to count tomorrow is how you hold on that target, okay? Depending on the elevation, the distance, the angle of the target. Angle can sometimes come into effect if you're pushing past a couple hundred yards. Um, so typical rule of thumb is if you're out there and you gotta shoot somebody from a high, high angle, aim low, pretty much the waistline, and you'll hit them in the chest, okay? All right, guys, once I've got all this, this rigging going for me, I've gotten outside the aircraft, I'm in that good leverage position, and I am minimizing all the vibration throughout the weapon it is just like you're on the range when you if you could forget about this behind you and forget about your speed and the rotor above your head it is just like on the range it is me this optic the target trigger control side alignment following through all of it stays the same as what you're doing out of the fly range so if you feel uncomfortable if you feel like you're not getting your hits you're probably not utilizing the fundamentals properly so again shooting is shooting is shooting we're just on a platform that's moving now, so we're just taking in consideration some of the lagging that we talked about and, uh, and all the other factors that are going in. And the reason I like to use this carbine, this weapon system right here, like we talked about in the optics portion, is because I could focus. I could shoot just like I normally would on the range dynamically. I can move quickly. I'm not taking a precision shot. It is very hard to gauge from a moving aircraft at a certain altitude and a certain speed what your lag really needs to be. I can't tell you as an instructor to a student that you need to lag at 150 feet at 40 knots, four inches behind the plate. 
Because to, for, for anybody to really be able to gauge that unless they do this on a daily basis uh, is very difficult to do. And there may be some times where you have to take a shot, watch for splash, and adjust off of that, okay, if you're not proficient at shooting out of this aircraft. Now I'll tell you, the more you shoot out of an aircraft, Obviously, just like shooting on the flat range, you're going to be able to pick things up. You see a moving target go by, you know where to lead on that thing at any given distance on that flat range. So, just like on the flat range in this aircraft, that will come into play as well with proficiency. So, that's a difficult thing to do. Um, you can utilize vehicles, you know, as a dry practice type of thing. You can get in the back of a pickup truck, try to get on a flat road, and drive and try to shoot down a hill. If you have that type of range capability, that's pretty far extreme, but we've done that before for training, and that is a good way to stay proficient without putting a bird in the air. So uh, little things like that uh, really help your weapons manipulation and your, and your proficiency and your accuracy on the target. All right, so something else we want to take in consideration is weapons manipulation. What if you need to do a speed reload uh, while you're in the air? Maybe you've got multiple targets. Uh, maybe you're suppressing somebody really hard and you've got to do a speed reload. Well, again, setting yourself up for success like we talked about, and I'll show you guys how it works right here. All right, weapons manipulation stays the same. I always want to keep my firing hand on fire control so I can manipulate the weapon system. We've got our bad lever on here so I can do that. I can control locking and releasing, and that really helps here in this situation when I'm in the air, I'm flying at 100 knots, uh, shooting at 100 yards. I've got a lot of things going on. The last thing I want to be doing is breaking the weapon down, which is hard to do now because, again, we have a tension device on the stock and trying to lock this thing to the rear back here. It gets difficult. So, again, I like to be able to work the gun right here if I need to. Coming behind you. Yep. All right, now we'll be good. Now, if I run into a reload situation, what I have to have is this laner system on that mag, because I don't care about that mag. I'm getting rid of it. So if I go into a lo bolt lock situation, I'm going to immediately release the magazine, insert the other one, hit the battery assist device, send the bolt back to the rear, I'm ready to fire again. So I just speed reloaded in about under a second there. This thing, it just hangs. When I get done with that threat, now it can be a situation where I can stow it. I've got a little fast sticks device on here, I can pop it off if I need to and put it away and then put another magazine on if I need to. So it just comes off because right back on. You can get, this is a simple flashlight lanyard or a keychain lanyard. You guys can find them anywhere. You could just use 550 core with little uh, keychain carabiners. They work great. So uh, good, good little gold nugget right there. Safety note on this magazine. If you do not retain your magazine and you do a speed reload and you are shooting out of specifically the right side of the aircraft especially, and this little thing goes into the tail rotor, what do you guys think is going to happen? You're going to have a short ride to the ground. Okay, this will destroy an aircraft. So this is a, this little lander right here, this little lander to me cost, how much does this thing cost, Scott? How much does this aircraft cost? Uh, three and a half, four million dollars. Okay, so this lander cost me about four million dollars if, if I don't have this thing set on the gun. So just think about that, okay? And more importantly, the lives that are inside the bird, obviously. So again, make sure everything is retained. Again, reminder, brass even. A piece of brass going into a tail rotor spinning at 5,000, 6,000 RPMs, is that what it runs? 7,000. 7,000 RPMs will take down an aircraft. Okay, I've landed many aircraft in Iraq because we had a piece of brass going into the tail rotor and you might as well just walk up to it and shoot it. That's how bad a damage it does to it. So, uh, and unfortunately in that situation, you're done. Your aerial platform operation is over and you've got to set down immediately and, and uh, assess that aircraft, make sure it's still flyable to get you home. And if you're over in Durka Durka stand somewhere, that's the last thing you want to do is set down in somebody's backyard and uh, get out and check your tail rotor and shut down for a little while. So think about that. Plus, if it hits in the wrong spot, you're not even going to have an opportunity to set down and check it to see if it uh, is ready to fly again. So very, very important safety notes there. Retain everything. That's why we go minimal gear. We go KISS gear. Keep it simple, stupid method. KISS on the weapon system. Everything is retained, dummy corded. Safety, safety, safety. Okay, guys, I've got uh, Scott with me from HeliQuest. Uh, he's one of their pilots here that's going to be flying with us today and tomorrow. Um, we have talked about all the other aspects of aerial platform operations as far as aircraft rigging, weapons rigging and selection. We talked about mission planning a little bit. We talked about SOPs and all the other things that go involved. But you can have all those things working for you in a great perfect world environment, but if you don't have communication, if you don't have the 
the relationship with the pilot shooter uh, and that dialect that's very specific there, then you might as well just scratch the whole mission. So that's one of the most important parts. Just like in any job, communication is, is survivability. And the better communication you have, the better your survivability rate's gonna be. So what we're gonna start off with is uh, we're gonna talk about setting yourself up for success with the rigging again. We're gonna go into a little bit more rigging here before we talk about um, the dialect back and forth. So the two types of comms, uh, your switches here are gonna be either a voice activated system, which means the mic is hot all the time. Um, so you can, you can talk into it at any time and everybody in the bird's gonna hear what you're saying. Uh, then you have a push to talk, which some birds only have a push to talk. So you actually have to push a button every time. So with the voice activated, that's great, um, especially on a system that you can, you can dial down and get rid of all the, the uh, other sounds and um, get rid of the wind. Uh, having the little foamies on the end of the mic is, is really important when you're hanging outside that aircraft like we talked about in the, the uh, weapons manipulation part. So uh, make sure you're set up for success there. So when you're running your headset, think about where it's connected. There's some uh, aircraft like this one, for instance, the Saystar has two uh, J boxes. It's got one up here behind the pilot seat and the one back up here. I like to keep them a little bit lower so it keeps the cables out of my way so that in case they fly in front of my face or something. Um, plus, I can activate the push to talk a little bit easier. So now we know the voice activation is, is pretty simple. You're just gonna talk in the system. But for that bird that doesn't have that voice activation, you may have to hold this in your reaction hand as you're flying, because it's obviously hard to push to talk, communicate, and identify a target, track the target, and try to get a good sight acquisition on it, and then attempt to fire. So a lot of birds, if you got enough slack here, you can hold it in your hand. I know on some weapon systems, you can even mount them. Um, I've seen them mounted on the side of the rail systems before, and you can basically sit here and talk, press the button, communicate with the air crew commander, and work your targets as necessary. So something to think about there, pretty important, because a lot of times, if you put it here on your vest or on your belt or something, you gotta relinquish control of your weapon with your reaction hand, press the button to talk, and then that target might be getting away from you. Then you gotta reacquire the grip, and you may wanna say something else. You may need to give a correction to the pilot while you're trying to re or reacquire that grip on the fire control or on the forehead of the weapon, and you're gonna miss your opportunity. So that's why it's important to make sure that your comms is set up for success. All right, now let's talk about that dialect. Um, a lot of times shooters will get in the aircraft and they're, they're kind of timid or they're, they're not talkable guys. So unfortunately, you gotta be a, a talker inside the aircraft because again, that clear communication and having that good uh, dialect with the pilot is, is, is paramount. So when you're talking to the pilot, make sure you have clear, precise, very quick communication, like short talk. So for an example, if I was to see something on the ground, uh, he may have a lot of things going on up here. He may be talking to ATC, air traffic control. He may be talking to another, uh, um, another cruiser on the ground or military guys on the ground. So if I'm gonna come in and break in on him, I'm gonna tell him, target nine o'clock, 300 meters. And then he's gonna identify and probably at that point is where the gelling is going to have to happen. You're going to have to know prior to that mission, what is he going to do? What's the expectation of, of him in that aircraft? Is he going to bank that aircraft hard to that 9 o'clock? Well, if he does that, and I'm attempting to fire at the same time because we didn't work out that communication prior to the mission planning, guess what I just did? I just shot through the rotors, which is very easy to do. These rotors will dip on you all day long and even slight turns. Now, if I say target nine o'clock, 200 meters, he knows inside his mind because we're proficient from working together that he doesn't really need to bank the target that much. He can kind of trim it to the left a little bit and because he knows that I'm capable of taking that shot at 200 yards. So there's that range thing you need to work out as well. Remember, anything outside that 200 yard line area is you're probably getting a little bit shakier liability wise, especially as an LEO uh, or um, a law enforcement officer, military guys, you may have to suppress a target at a distance, that's fine. But you guys that earn jobs that may increase that liability because you take a shot at 400 yards from a moving aircraft, that's hard to do, okay? And when you do that and you miss, where did that round go? So instead of me sitting here and telling him to hold at 400 yards, I can say left bank. He left banks and with a, within a second, we're now within 200 or 100 yards. So that aircraft can be on top of that target that quickly. So which one would you rather do? Be on top of the target in a second and engage him accurately and have less liability or take a chance at 400 yards and waste 30 rounds and have 30 rounds going off into the streets of whatever city you're operating in. Uh, or it may be a faraway country, maybe overseas in a combat area. You know, that's still a liability. You hit an innocent person, that is a liability. And you need to take that into, into effect there. So for example, um, maybe I see a target at six o'clock. 
we have some commands, uh, you know, as far as, you know, we know we're calling out of range, we know we're calling out of clock direction, but something we use is RTT. So if I said, Scott, target, six o'clock, RTT, 500 meters. So he knows, okay, RTT, return to target. Yeah, return to target, so, so I know the target's behind me. Obviously, I'm facing forward at the 12 o'clock position. Target's behind me, we need to acquire it. So I'm gonna basically be doing what an RTT is in the uh, civilian world, it's known as an ag turn. You're basically pulling the nose up a little bit and kicking in some turn, or kicking in some tail and turning the helicopter back to the six o'clock position. Now this is a pretty evasive and can be an aggressive maneuver and at that point because he and I are gelling together. I'm gonna to say, okay, copy RTT coming left. I'm basically gonna be turning the helicopter pretty hard to the left, kicking in some tail and returning to the six o'clock position. He knows that he cannot engage that target until I roll out of that turn and the rotor disc is back in a level position. So, and then I can say, okay, green light or something, you know, some sort of command Again, short talk where he knows that it's safe to engage. Okay, going hot. So, Scott, what are some uh, what are some other considerations that you might want to take in, whether inside the aircraft communications or dialect? Well, I think it's important to point out that um, you know, with different helicopter operators nationwide, that different law enforcement agencies may be utilizing. Each helicopter operator will be using different types of helicopters, even though we have two B-2 A-STARS here in the hangar right now, they're both configured differently as far as the communication systems go. So I think it's important that once you do find that, that right helicopter operator to work with, it's important to get the agency in there and spend half a day um, going over everything that uh, Travis and Chris have been going over with as far as the rigging goes, where to find all the hard points for all your rigging systems, and then making sure that the communication systems work with your helmets and all that good stuff and uh, you know, just make sure that all that stuff is set to go before you actually go out on the mission because you could be utilizing a Bell 407, Bell Long Ranger, Hughes 500, A-Star B-2, B-3, and even just those few types of helicopters that I mentioned can be configured differently. So instead of just showing up blind at some random helicopter operator say, hey, we want to use your helicopter, I mean, it's probably important to get in there and, and uh, you know, make sure everything works so when you do actually get dispatched to go out and do a mission everything's already set all you do is you hop in you clip in you plug in your communications of course you already did your 10 or 15 minute brief with the pilot and the uh, law enforcement agency and off you go and do the mission you know like scott in our in our world we kind of compare that to um, dry firing okay do you need to go to the range do you need to do live fire to practice weapons manipulation now, so it's expensive, yes, to get this aircraft up in the air to take shooters out, which you obviously should do at least quarterly, what I would suggest, um, if you can get an opportunity, if you have that time and training opportunity to do so, I suggest to get the bird up in the air and to work all that out. But if you don't have that time and opportunity, but you can get over to a hangar, to a facility like this, or your agency maybe has helicopters or your military unit, there's no reason why you guys can't go to that facility for two hours and work through with the pilots communication, dialect, rigging, weapons, sitting on the skid, getting comfortable, making sure all your stuff's pre-staged in case you do get a hot call one day and you have to come run in here and chase an active shooter or chase a, uh, you know, some insurgency around the world somewhere, whatever the case may be, maybe it's a search and rescue operation or surveillance. You're jumping in here and you are clipping in with your pre-staged stuff and you're ready to fly. So. so I think another thing to point on too is uh, this helicopter in particular is uh, what they call carded with the Department of Interior, Forestry, BLM. So we do a lot of government work, so it has a lot of, it's equipped well for their types of missions. So we have a, uh, an FM radio in here that can be programmed with a lot of local law enforcement frequencies. So that's something else that, you know, he and I can go over. Also with this helicopter in particular, it's something you and I would go over before we actually got dispatched. Um, where Travis is sitting, he cannot communicate with the ground. So that's something that I would have to do for him. So. That's something that we would need to figure out again before we go out. So, I mean, there's so many different you know, variables. So that's why I just wanted to point out that it's important to go over all that stuff beforehand. And you probably know also, Scott, I, I've done a little flying um, since I was a kid with my dad that communication, especially uh, with like working with ATC and people all around you or other aircraft can be difficult and, and needs practice as well. Um, and the same with the shooter back here, calling out those commands under stress. I mean, it's hard enough for me to just say, you know, Scott, target nine o'clock, 300 meters, RTT left side. I've got to really think about what I'm saying there. So to do that under stress with a guy with a gun or is about to shoot an innocent civilian or he's about to shoot one of your police officers on the ground and you see it before they do, you're going to be amped up. 
So you've got to be able to practice that communication, just like you got to come in here and practice, you know, uh, rigging, going out to the range, practice your weapons. So communication is, is paramount. You guys as law enforcement obviously understand that, but everybody out there needs to understand how important this one key aspect is right here and how that will make this mission so much more successful. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Okay, guys, we're out here at the range, uh, the aerial platform operations range we're going to be shooting today. And uh, we've got a various array of targets set up out there, realistic targets, steel plates, and some LaRue poppers. First, what we're going to do is we're going to kick off a standard weapon safety brief, just like we're on the flat range, because we are going to be going hot here in a little bit. So uh, first firearm safety rule, treat every weapon as if it were loaded, Okay, even if you've ensured that it is unloaded. You never point your weapon at anything you not intend to destroy, specifically the helicopter. Okay. Um, if you are loading the weapon system, do not load the weapon system upward. I know we teach a breakdown and loading it, but we want you guys to make sure you have muscle awareness on the ground and in the air. Okay, what's above your head? The rotor. And uh, no loading inside the aircraft. You have to be out in your position. And when Chris or myself give you the command to go ahead and load, uh, the magazine will be inserted. You can just send your bolt home at that point. Okay, and then you're ready to go. Third firearm safety rule. Obviously, keep your finger straight and off the trigger and outside the trigger guard until you're up on target with the intent to fire. Fourth firearm safety rule, keep your weapon on safe until we're up on target with the intent to fire. So just like if you're on a flat range, when you're coming in on your gun run and you're looking at your sights, you're looking at the target, come off safe and engage. As soon as you're done with your run, come back on safe. Fifth firearm safety rule is very important out here, just like it is on the ground, but up here we've got a lot of different things to think about. Be aware of your target's foreground and its background before you fire. Again, like we talked about already, what are some of the things that could be in the foreground? Rotors, okay? Um, so that is the first thing that I identify before I even start to engage. Even if you think you're flying flat and level, it's always value added to look up at it, okay? On the ground, target's foreground, maybe there's people on the ground. Uh, maybe we've got st staging areas out here. Maybe the uh, vehicles are, you know, kind of at your one o'clock or something if you're flying that direction and they are not clear. If you you got to think about your reflection here. You got you got to think about your uh, ricochets. If you get around and you're firing at an angle and can skip over towards a safety area, you've got to be careful with that. Okay. So again, Chris is going to tell you when you're allowed to fire. Like Travis said, there's not a lot of room in this healer. This one's really small. So as you start to suck back in, make sure your muzzle's outside because uh, on this side, uh, with the pilot flying left seat, he's he's right there. So I want to really keep my muzzle away from him or any of the electronic packages in here. All right, let's turn and burn. Hold that leading to that trail edge and watch the impact. Okay. Okay. Go ahead and get out on that skid, Joe. Don't be afraid of it. If I come up on a target, I can actually get my gun up, start driving that gun, and moving and actually following that target. Put that down right where you need it. Hold that down there. So what we have to do, instead of leading that target like we typically would do in a ground situation, we now have to lag the target, which what happens is our forward speed and that bullet flying flies forward with your forward momentum of the aircraft and meets the target. Yeah, lag, gotta lag that target. Hop in guys, I'll set you up. Take my QD, stick it in the QD cup on the stock. Now I'm ready to go. Is that the all right, Todd? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. All right, weapons manipulation stays the same. I always want to keep my firing hand on fire control so I can manipulate the weapon system. You, if you can forget about this behind you, forget about your speed and the rotor above your head, it is just like on the range. It is me, this optic, the target, 
trigger control, side alignment, following through, all of it stays the same as what you're doing out of the fly range. So if you feel uncomfortable, if you feel like you're not getting your hits, you're probably not utilizing the fundamentals properly. So again, shooting is shooting is shooting. I was, yeah, because these guys were saying all about a foot or so. Yeah, and on some of them it could be 5 to 10, but faster you go, that 20 to 30 knots, that lags even more. Once you, once you get to that edge of that threat, then you can keep it there. It's that first round's really tough. Excellent job. Thanks. Really good shot. Yeah, that's great. Good times. Good times, man. All right, man. let's bail out. Yeah. All right. All right, guys, that concludes uh, aerial platform operations. Obviously, this is the meat and potatoes part along with the rigging. And now you're seeing where everything starts to come together. So having that confidence in, in the way in which you guys rig, there's different aircrafts. We don't have military helicopters here. We don't have 60s. We don't have uh, dolphin style helicopters like the, the Coast Guard uses. Those things gonna be modified differently. Uh, it's extremely important for you to understand what assets are in your area and what also assets are out there available for your department to purchase because they can uh, lend you to be more successful in that mission that you might be doing whether it's shooting or whether it's reconnaissance or whether it's also uh, fast roping out of the heel want to a building to get more assaulters there in a timely manner. Uh, that all has to be taken into consideration. Uh, for a lot of you guys, that, that first trigger pull, you know, you see how 15 knots, only 15 knots, how far that bullet really goes off target. So as you can see, uh, semi-autos, there's a, there's a huge force multiplier with that weapon system. We have that tendency to where we initially want to put our dot dead center on what it is that we're shooting at. And then we get in a helo and we put that dot there and we squeeze off that first shot and it's five feet to the to the right of where we intended to shoot or to the left depending upon which side of the helo and which way you were moving point being is our brains see that shot and on that semi-auto we automatically start driving and creating that lag that we need to and then once you fire off those next shots those next consecutive rounds that's when we start finding ourselves being a little bit more successful for you, Garth, that, you know, on, on, on some of those, you were peppering right around that last popper, and then it was that last shot that put that thing down, which was which was outstanding. But that first shot wasn't there where it needed to be, but you walked it right into where you needed to be to finally, finally, on your last shot, put that popper down. So I thought you did a great job. I thought everybody did a great job. Yeah, guys, you know, hopefully now you can see how easy this really is, considering there's a lot of moving parts, um, but once you get out here and you do it, uh, it's the best way to, to experience it is to be in that helicopter and actually shoot from it. And you can see, guys, from your second passes that you're getting hits. Um, and uh, once you got that lag down, like Chris was talking about, it was there. But going back to what I said in the beginning of the class, think about the asset available. Think about the resources and how, how much survivability um, bonus this gives you. Okay? It gives your ground teams. But you put putting yourself in a helicopter over those those ground forces, or as a surveillance, or or search and rescue uh, out in these canyons and stuff, it is it is just paramount in how much that gives your agency or your unit. So don't neglect it. Think about what we said in the beginning about you know, hey, the biggest thing I hear when I ask, well, hey, why don't you guys shoot from helicopters or use aerial platforms for other operations? They say, well, because of our budget. So think about what I said in the beginning of class and and, uh, and do the math. It's not that bad. Um, Good shooting today, guys. Good flying. Everybody was safe. And uh, it was a pleasure, you know, being out here and working with you guys and working with HeliQuest and, uh, and everybody else involved. Victor, thanks for coming out and uh, sharing your knowledge with Night Vision. And uh, stay proficient, guys. That's all you can do from this point on. You know the basic building blocks, and that's exactly what this is. All you can do is take it to the next level. Excel up that ladder of excellence. So uh, thanks for coming out.
Okay guys, let's talk more about weapons accessories and setting yourself up for success for low light and, and, and night operations. Uh, with me is Vic DeCostola from Tactical Night Vision Company. He's going to go into some of the technical specs and, uh, and proper selection and talk about some of the other night uh, accessories that will uh, uh, make you more successful at night and increase your survivability rate. Vic? Thanks, Travis. We found over the years, um, night vision's come a long way. Um, it's very specialized, very mission specific for a mission at hand. Uh, as Travis talked about, uh, looking at all the weapon systems, the rigging, uh, different platforms for optics, same thing applies at night uh, for air interdiction, air surveillance as well. We have a number of tools that are available to us. Um, over the last several years, there's been some great advances in night vision technology and also thermal technology. We have some devices here uh, on the table we'll briefly go over that's really helped uh, from the pilot that, that you've seen, uh, all the green from uh, that you've seen the IR lasers going up in the Iraqi war, from the ground troops to the aviators, um, some marvel technology that's really helped them uh, get their mission accomplished. Um, some of the things you might be familiar with that we have on the table is um, a dual system um, binocular. This is basically most of the pilots uh, call this the Anvis 9s that you see. Uh, the Anvis 9s are a dual system uh, that most of the pilots do wear. Um, the system itself is a dual tube uh, binocular uh, with pinnacle ITT technology tubes we'll talk about briefly. Um, the unit itself, of course, the pilots wear over both eyes when we talk about dual tubes. The advantage of the dual tube technology, obviously, is you have a great increased depth perception. You have a great 3D stereo effect and you have two intensifiers coming into both your eyes. Pilots, of course, need that increased depth perception while they're flying, obviously. That's one type of system. Uh, we also see ground uh, folks also using dual tube systems. I, for one, when we talk to and teach with LE and a lot of ground folks nowadays, we like using one tubes, basically a PVS-14 over one eye. We like that for a number of reasons. One, you have one, a dark adapted eye. You have another eye that's actually night vision adapted. The other good reason is your brain will switch, switch back and forth from going one night vision eye to one dark adapted eye, and you can look at other targets of opportunity, either one through your one eye, or you can actually look at your either instruments in a, in a helicopter or wherever you might else be looking, you can have the other eye open as well. So those are the single tube systems that you see, such as hooked up to this uh, helmet system here. Um, the beauty we all talk, that we're talking about now with the helmet systems is it's all helmet mounted. There are some limitations as we talk about if we go into a night vision platform that's on a gun. Why there is specific advantages, obviously, of using a clip-on device that you see here in front of a sniper scope. The major drawback, obviously, for night ops, especially in the helicopters Travis talked about, you want to get your, your 1X system out there. You want to keep your head up as much as you can to look at targets of opportunity. This is basically like looking through a straw in the middle of a night. Your decreased field of view, and more importantly, you have to point your gun at everything you want to look at if you're actually using a knot. So if you're not using a white light, obviously, you're, it's completely dark. Stealth is your main concern uh, for the suspect. You don't want him to see you. The only thing you want to do is just sneak up on the suspect. This is where knots come into their own. A knot system such as PVS-22 that clips out in front of a sniper system will give you the ability of not losing your day dope on your, on your day scope putting night vision in front and what once again the drawback is you got to point your gun at everything that you want to look at so that's a drawback that we we really don't like to use from uh, an air uh, surveillance or interdiction platform with a knot out in front what we like to do is what Travis talked about is having what we call an IR laser system an IR laser system combined uh, with a head mounted um, night vision system has so many advantages uh, tenfold advantages the biggest system we find uh, number one is that keeping your head up shouldering the weapon, keeping your head up, scanning for targets. Your night vision is viewing your area. Your IR laser is actually designating, aiming for your target as you would a red dot scope, but you basically are placing a dot like a visible laser that you lag behind a target and you're moving helicopter. You would also use the illuminator as well to illuminate any dark environments in a rural area, in your, or I should say in a very dark environment. You need some type of artificial illumination. Night vision still needs some sort of light to work with. In other words, if you're in a cave and couldn't see your hand in front of your face, more importantly, you're in a subway doing subway clearing drill somewhere, and it's completely dark, you can't see your hand in front of your face, sorry, night vision is just not going to work for you. You must have an artificial IR source for the night vision to see. Typical Gen 3 tube amplifies any pinpoint of light about 30,000 times. So it's important that some type of light is introduced for the night vision intensifier tube to actually work effectively. Here we have the IR laser that helps you both with an IR designator aimer, this particular unit, or the PQ-15 here, the APTL, has a built-in visible laser 
an IR laser as well as an IR illuminator. The beauty of the IR illuminators on these systems is they're a flood adjustable from a tight beam and they also can flood out as well to give you a big large focused area of illumination. The other huge advantage for aerial interdiction is your ground folks. Ground folks equipped with a nod can also see what you're pointing at. A, a, big, a, big, a big advantage of course obviously Guys on the ground can see what you're engaging, they can see what you're doing, and vice versa. If the ground folks as well are also aiming at a suspect or aiming at, aiming at an object, your aerial platform that's using nods will see that eye or laser pointing at what he's looking at. We also see out there in the field, a lot of folks that you see are running thermal uh, thermoscopes. We have the thermal vision systems that you see in most helicopters or flare systems. Uh, they work off heat. Uh, those are the biggest advantages that you see with thermal systems. Uh, Travis is picking up as a state-of-the-art front line. What our troops are using is called a PASS-13, weapon mountable, uh, either a 1X or a 3X system, a 640 uh, by 480 system that can be weapon mounted as well. The advantages, obviously, of thermal is they can th see through fog or rain, where night vision basically would, become, would be rendered useless. Fire departments, of course, love the technology thing through smoke, fog, and rain. They can use thermal. Some of the disadvantages of thermal that we see versus night vision is much more resolution with night vision. Thermal devices see heat. They don't get good facial recognition that a normal uh, Gen 3 intensifier tube night vision will see. Therefore, better target identification, suspect identification on the ground for you as well as your ground folks as well. So either way, both systems that you see can work in combination to give you a great deal of view and, and great deal of advantage out there in the field when you're working these operations. Some of the other systems that have really helped uh, as well, uh, we talked about the helmet systems. Basically a fairly, fairly new system that has just come out not too long ago is basically we, a helmet system uh, with a PVS-14 on it, but the main advantage is the helmet record system. Uh, this system gives you 86 hours of video. Um, there are some very key elements of this helmet system um, that has a pinhole camera here. Uh, it is a, a 720 by 480 resolution pinhole camera that can easily adapt for day operations. This little pinhole camera can come off and hook into the back of the prism of a PVS-14. Uh, it's invaluable for gathering intelligence of an area, an overwatch area that you need to go look for intelligence. Um, from basic from the LE use of going in for court, going in for evidence, going in for man had a gun, no he didn't, yes he did, that sort of scenario. Um, this information as well for the commanders that are out there, um, it's a great value to them for folks entering a building, um, doing room searches, uh, doing hot entries. You have a camera live for liability or any other type of uh, uh, court uh, liability issues that might come about. You have that system to record actually at your fingertips. Um, it's a marvel of technology. Uh, it's a great system. Travis also talked about earlier about strobes. I can't stress enough about safety at night. Let's face it, you, you can't see much outside your field of view, 42 degree field of view on uh, a typical monocular. Outside of that, when it's dark, you're not seeing much. So it's imperative that your ground operations folks, as well as your air operation, whoever was, runs with type of beacons that we have here. Um, Obviously, safety is number one control that you see the IR beacon. Uh, most, of these are, most of these are not uh, that strong where it's going to bloom out the night vision um, or bloom out and, and have a, a de detrimental effect on what you're looking at. The beauty of these systems um, is let's say we have a suspect who is sophisticated might also have a strobe system. Strobe systems that are available for LE as well also are programmable. So basically, we say we know who's who in the zoo. You can set the sequences that you want. Everybody knows going in before your operation, your team training, your team brief, set your beacons, set your sequences of what you only are going to be using. You know what that sequence is going to be, what that interval might be. You know if somebody enters the area of operation that either doesn't have a beacon on or his beacon's not matching yours, you could have a serious issue at your hand and it'll have to be looked at. So once again, IR beacons, I think, are, are very critical uh, for mission success, that you have beacons uh, for safety reasons. You know with your other operators are out in the field of operations. Uh, that, is, that is a great, that is a big importance in, in our eyes. Now, Vic, a lot of guys use um, IR chem lights and uh, other IR Correct. patches and stuff like that. What's some of the pros and cons of that stuff? Correct. Um, IR patches, obvious, about to go into that. I'm glad Travis brought it up. IR patches, as you see, are, are flag patches here, any glint tape on your uniforms, obviously. They must have IR illumination. It's just like a um, reflector on a bicycle. It must have a headlight on it 
for it to actually see and focus and actually see the reflector, same thing. With your nod that you're wearing, if a bright illuminator or eye, any type of IR illuminator, whether it's a filter over a flashlight, any IR illuminator hits the reflective patch, you will see these globe uh, pretty brightly just as you were a bicycle reflector. So critical as well, if you have any IR energy that will reflect off these patches, they work a great deal. Patches, IR glint tape, or any of the IR treated tapes work extremely well for uniforms. Now have you heard anything about the size of the glint tapes or patches? I always heard that having an American flag like this is just overkill for some things, uh, depending on what kind of airship's looking down on you. Uh, is that a factor sometimes? It is. Um, it also depends on the, the power of the illuminator looking at, yourself, uh, looking at you. Okay. If we're looking at a lower power illuminator obviously uh, a very high power illuminator such as your Attila that pumps out 150 milliwatts out of the illuminator is going to glow a great great uh, deal it's going to be very 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 bright so it's not really size it's more based on it's more based on the actual power of the actual illuminator that you're using most systems that you use the 30 milliwatt app TLs and d-ball systems uh, any size patch usually works uh, quite well a little patch will do well um, but the bigger the patch, if you have more illumination, will bring more glow, more bloom effect to what you're looking at in your nod. Yeah, because I remember in Iraq, we would talk about who's in the zoo, and Spectre gunships looking down and seeing guys with three glit tape patches on their heads, and they said it was a little overkill. It, it's hard to tell even who's in the zoo at that point because it gets over. Yeah, the IR glint tapes are very, very sensitive to the IS spectrum of light, very, very spectrum to the IR spectrum. So uh, use it diligently. It doesn't take much to work. So um, if we had to tell guys what to use as a ground team going in a house, LEO support operation, or whatever case may be, maybe maritime operation at night, what would you suggest? IR strobes, IR chem lights, programmable strobes, what would be the best thing that's based, practical for guys to use? Based on uh, emission requirements, overall safety, IR chems would be the easiest to use. Readily available, easy to use to have IR chem lights uh, on your person, hang on your gear to know that you're there. Um, once again, you don't want to overpower your chem lights or more chem lights that have more IR goop, as we call it, than, than others. So some IR chem lights are very, very, very bright, which sometimes you're looking at one big glow. Your ER operations are going to see you as a big glow, so that's a hindrance as well. So Now, does that, does that interfere with the ambient lighting around? Maybe there's a street light or something. How do you tell the difference between IR and street light? Can you, can you tell that? You can, even with street lights, unless you're looking at a very, very strong, you know, beam that's coming down on you, you'll clearly see from the color as well as the intensity of an IR chem light or glint tape, even in, in strong uh, urban lighting, you will definitely see your strobes, you'll definitely see your chem lights, and especially your glint tape uh, with no issues. And speaking of the actual blooming effect, um, Travis talked about it, Chris talked about, about using a suppressor. I highly recommend using a suppressor uh, for nods. Um, you're going to get a bloom effect, except unless you use the, the best muzzle brake available as Holly's high, highly recommended. Using a 50 BMG, when you're looking at huge muzzle blasts, splashes out there, you're going to be blinded. Uh, there's going to be bloom coming off that night vision. You're going to be blinded probably close to a quarter to a half second. I can only recommend the best thing is put a suppressor on your gun if your agency has them. If not, if you're going to use any type of night operations, seriously look at a good flash hider. It is, is, it is needed. Or you could be blind for about a quarter second, especially with rapid follow-up shots. You'll see what, they, what we call a white flash bloom. Some of the older technology, Gen 3s, that didn't have the ITT pinnacle autogated technology where that regulates the amount of light coming in the tube, that could cause serious effect when the fight is on or the fight goes to white lights, the flash bangs go off using something, not a suppressor, and the bright lights go on and, a, and, a, and the bloom comes out of the, of the muzzle, your night vision can actually could turn off. Uh, it's called automatic brightness control. It's used to actually save the night vision intensifier tube uh, from any damage. Of course, that's a real issue. Uh, you'd have to go to some other backup system that you have, look down naked eye through your, your red dot sight. Uh, but more importantly, the pinnacle autogated technology minimizes that uh, bloom effect. It also minimizes that the chance of the night vision going down or turning off for two minutes while you have the power reset it to come back on is greatly minim minimized. We've seen that with a lot of uh, law enforcement agencies using older night vision technology, um, especially from an aerial platform support role, uh, looking down on a bunch of assaulters sitting in a house with multiple flashbangs going off and the guy in the air is not shutting down because that flash from there is can be critical as well because of that technology. Yeah, some of the new uh, newer technology, Pinnacle Auto Gated, uh, that's offered from ITT, um, really mitigates uh, that issue and they've come a long way. Um, some of the closing uh, comments, uh, we talked about um, some of the versatilities of monoculars such as the PVS-14 is to be hooked up with a regular day camera. 
You can easily get a actual mount system that will C-mount actually to your lens of your 35 millimeter camera. You take that big lens off, hook this right into the body housing of your 35 millimeter. From there, you can actually purchase aftermarket 3X or 5X magnifiers that screw right into the PVS-14. You have your magnification for there, so folks can see the versatility of an actual monocular system. Head mounted, um, as well as camera mounted, and in extreme needs when people need to go passive, a PVS-14 can also, also go on the back of a low, a low uh, caliber type of uh, rifle weapon as well. Back of an Aimpoint Micro T1, also in the last ditch effort, also works extremely well when you need to go passive. And I guess I'll, I'll close by saying a word of caution with IR lasers and IR illuminators. Um, even cheap Walmart Gen 1 systems can see your IR lasers. So you have a great IR laser system that's going out there, you know, you know, two kilometers out there, you are way out there. Even bad guys with the cheapest night vision devices can see IR lasers quite clearly. Only use designators, IR lasers, illuminators when absolutely necessary. Um, bad guys, as we talked about, can see them. Using a PVS-14 on the back of a Micro T1 uh, is a great combination. It gives you passive work. It gives you just, no one else can see you. You're just looking in the back of the actual Micro T1 or Comp M4. You can see your dot. It has night vision settings on the system and you can engage your targets. But once again, at this advantage, obviously, you have to point your gun at anything that you want to look at. But for passive operations, we don't want anybody to see your presence, but you still need a night vision, a halfway decent uh, accuracy behind a red dot a PVS-14 gives you that versatility behind a red dot system. Well, Vic, thanks for coming out and educating us in the class on, on uh, night vision, and it's greatly going to enhance people's survivability rate just hearing that, that information right there. I mean, I've been working with night vision for a long time, and, and I just got educated. So, again, uh, thanks for coming out, man. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, guys. Okay, what we're going to do now, guys, is we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Scott. Uh, he's flying the A-Star today, so uh, he'll do a pilot's brief, and we'll go over some safety procedures and some emergency procedures of the aircraft. Okay, guys, welcome uh, to Helicopter Safety 101. We'll uh, go over basically uh, seat belts. We'll have a cameraman up front, so I'll show you the four-point harness there. Um, typically, we'll go over how to latch and strap down the seat belts, but since you guys are using harnesses and rigging, we'll go over that once we walk over to the other side there. I'm going to go over uh, emergency equipment, where it's all located, what to do in the event of an emergency, and then of course, uh, because we're going to be loading and unloading hot, we'll go over some, uh, some stuff there to make sure it's all done uh, safely. Okay, so I'll go ahead and start off by uh, just showing the four-point harness up front here. It's pretty typical of any airline seatbelt that you'll find in commercial airliners. It just has the buckle that you lift up 90 degrees to release, okay? So you have your male end, female end, and you have two shoulder harnesses. So if the cameraman will be having one over each shoulder, you can put the two latches together so they form a T. We'll stick the male end to the female end there and into the, into the latch. Of course, you want to give yourself some slack there so it fits around your waist. Just like so. Okay. Communications uh, headsets are going to be voice activated, meaning that once the microphone is close to your mouth, all you have to do is talk freely. Okay, so um, the microphone does need to be close to your mouth. If it's more than, say, an inch away, it's probably not going to pick up your voice. So sometimes it tends to walk away from your mouth when you're moving around and stuff. So if you're talking, you're not hearing yourself in your own headset, just grab the microphone and stick it next to your mouth like this. So right about there is good. If it's out here, it's not going to pick up anything. So just kind of grab it and just hold it while you're talking, and you can get back to doing whatever you're doing. Okay? Now because the doors are off, all the background noise, especially all the wind moving through the cabin is going to keep the microphone pretty much hot the whole time. It is kind of annoying and there's really no way to adjust the sensitivity to get rid of it. So basically it's going to be wide open the whole time and that way you can just talk freely. Okay. Um, in the event of an unscheduled landing, that's an emergency landing, highly unlikely but it is always a possibility. Um, just remember to follow all my instructions and wait till I get the helicopter on the ground and get the blades completely stopped before you exit. Um, if the helicopter happens to roll, you want to make sure uh, you wait until the dust settles, so to speak, before you exit. Also look around, make sure nobody around, around you needs your assistance getting out. So basically, uh, once you get the helicopter on the ground, 
get the blades completely stopped, you can exit, exit towards the front or the sides, keeping in mind the tail rotors in the back there. Of course, it will be stopped at that point, but always a good practice to exit towards the front. Um, if, again, if the helicopter does roll, um, wait till the dust settles, and then uh, you can uh, exit the aircraft at that time. Again, making sure nobody needs your assistance, especially me. Um, if I become inca incapacitated after a crash landing, um, a couple of things you want to be aware of, and I'll show these, I'll explain to you now, and once we walk around the other side, I'll show them to you. Um, basically, you want to kill the electrical and cut off the fuel and make sure that's going to, you know, hopefully prevent a fire. Most accidents um, are survivable after the impact, but most of the fatalities are due to uh, the fire that ensues afterwards. So it's really important to know where the fuel shutoff is and the electrical shutoff. And uh, again, I'll show that to you when we go over. Um, there's an emergency locator transmitter located on board. It's in the left-hand side cargo. Again, I'll show that once we get over there. The emergency equipment, first aid kit, and survival gear is in the side cargo. The way you open up the A-Star cargo door is these two silver latches. You're going to push that button there, this one on the aft, and then the center button will be the third one that you hit. The uh, yellow container there is a survival kit, and of course the red bag there is your first aid kit. Okay, so fuel shut off is this small red knob that's lock wired. It's actually placarded fuel shut off. So after an accident, you're going to want to snap that off, killing the throttle, pulling that all the way towards the after the helicopter is also going to cut off the fuel. But you want to do both of those. And then uh, this is called the pedestal. It's pretty much all the electrical switches right here. The only red button on the pedestal is the electrical kill switch. So you got three things, fuel, throttle, electrical so in that order fuel throttle and kill the electrical in the top right hand corner the harnessing the shooter will be sitting here on the edge obviously and you're going to be rigged in if we do happen to go down crash position is going to be get back inside the helicopter front seat passenger cameraman you want to lean back in your seat belt so the inertia reel lock locks you into place okay for the instructor and student basically what you want to do is if we're going down i'm going to let you know over the comms you're basically going to tuck yourself back inside here and just brace yourself up against the back Okay, in that position there. Um, one thing for the shooter to be aware of when we're on this side here is the, uh, of course, all the flight controls and the throttle. You want to make sure that when you're on the side here and you're sliding around in your position that none of your straps or anything can get caught around the throttle. The throttle is going to be in this position in flight. Something happens to get caught around it and you lean back and the throttle comes back with you. Guess what? We just killed the flame in the engine and we're going down. So just be very aware of this. Um, probably don't need to be any further out than here. Okay. So just be aware of that, that that's there. Um, final thing would be the emergency locator transmitter located in this side cargo compartment. It's mounted up on the side here. It's uh, impact activated. So after an accident, it should activate itself, but it's a good idea to make sure that it is transmitting. There's an activation switch right there. Just switch it to the on position. You can actually remove this unit from the harness. It has an antenna that you can screw in and it'll transmit the signals. It's also activated by a push button on the instrument panel, which is this little red square up here. Only red square on the instrument panel. Just push the button. It'll illuminate and let you know that it's transmitting. One thing I failed to mention too is approaching and exiting the helicopter here. So uh, once um, we'll have the first guy in, we'll do the first run. When we come back, we'll unload hot. So we'll have the second guy in standby over here in the corner of the field. And once the first guy's uh, unrigged, just make sure you look up at the rotor disc, get a good idea of where it's at, and you walk towards the front of the helicopter. Okay. Once he's clear of the rotor disc, um, second guy, look for eye contact and give you a thumbs up. Then you can approach, come in, instructor will harness you in, and we'll get going from there. Okay, so very important, just always, uh, whenever you're approaching or exiting the helicopter, always have good eye contact and some sort of hand signal or a head nod from the pilot before you approach. Just don't come in at your own leisure there, okay? So, and uh, just to kind of keep things uh, safe, one of my biggest pet peeves is don't rush. Just keep everything safe, just take your time. Make, every, make sure you keep everything below your shoulders when you're approaching the helicopter, you don't stick anything up into the blades, okay?